We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. to the Friday edition of Free Association Radio. This is Robert Phoenix, and you're here right now taking part in the Friday forecast. And it would not be a Free Association Radio ever if I was not able to have Freeman show up at some point in time because he's one of the most free associating people I've seen out there on the fringe of the Internet and other sorted media bringing in really astounding information, everything from his stellar work on Obama as uh, the clone of Akhenaten to his really uh, laser-like focus on people like Anna Nicole Smith and Britney Spears and the whole Hollywood Babylon experience. And we're going to bring Freeman on in just a moment and um, get into this in a very big way. We're going to talk about Weird Stuff, which is his latest project. And it's something he's going to be kicking off with a Kickstarter uh, program and uh, in the next couple of days. So we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, if you have not been paying attention, World War III is about to break loose, or at least so it seems, in the uh, Middle East and North Africa thanks to a, a bogus film created by a bogus person. And maybe we can get into this a little bit deeper with Freeman as well. It's uh, it's breaking right now for our very eyes. And um, it started with a, a film called, I believe it's called uh, Arab Innocence or Muslim Innocence. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible movie. And the whole thing is a complete scam and a sham. And, and uh, it was started by a, a character down in Southern California who went by the name of Sam Baselli and various other names. And right now, um, North Africa and the Middle East is on fire, and, or at least that's what the MSM will like, uh, like you to believe. And it's probably true to a certain extent. And uh, we're going to get into this, hopefully, with Freeman, amongst a few other things. Um, so let's not waste any more time. Let's just bring Freeman on, and, and let's, uh, let's drop the needle on this thing. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Hey. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm coming through loud and clear, I hope. Yes, indeed. Uh, and resonant as well. So we've got you on the uh, loud and clear part, and, and uh, your tone is nice. So how are you doing out here in California? Oh, it's been great. Uh, this whole travel has just been amazing. <laughs> The things we've seen and the things we've done, people just don't believe. And here we've been on the road for a year now. Right. And just visiting fans of the show, friends of Freeman, 
uh, going around trying to show people that the universe and the world is actually not out to get them. Right. And it's, it's kind of a difficult sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd probably convince you that Obama's a clone before I could convince you that humans were good. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting perspective. So let's let's go back and uh, revisit your de- your decision to pull up stakes and hit the road. Um, was that an economic decision? A philosophical decision? Was it kind of both? What 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 made you to get get? Because you were kind of a roadie for a while. And then you settled back, you settled in and did some serious work, and then you decided to hit the road again. What was the what was the genesis behind that? Well, so, yeah, I've been traveling since 1999. Well, no, let me scratch that. Since 1993, I've been wandering the United States and now the world. Um, and in this, I discovered that there were beautiful humans everywhere, and, and everywhere I went, it seemed as if miraculous events guided me to where I needed to be. And it was this philosophy that really set the foundation for everything I'm doing and everything I wanted to say to everyone. Um, the rest is just to draw you in, right? Then it's to show you the answer. The problem with synchronicity is that you have to experience it to believe it, and you have to believe it to experience it. So <laughs> you're kind of in a catch. So as things progressed, uh, yeah, I've been doing radio. I, I settled down in Austin, Texas. I didn't mean to, but I started the TV show there. Uh, once again, just a, a curiosity, synchronicity. I was given the opportunity. Now, this is before YouTube. <laughs> this is just as Google Video was coming out, and the only way you could make a TV show was to have a TV studio. Right. And so I was given uh, a place in Austin Access and was able to start my TV show. So that, that actually occupied my life for the next five, six years. So I didn't travel so much, but that's not to say I didn't travel. Right. Uh, but so... <clears throat> um, I, I, yeah, so I've been traveling around for a bit, 20 years, and I settled down for the TV show and got that going, got the radio show going after the TV show, started things on YouTube, you know, the, right when YouTube began. I was almost the first video on YouTube, and then, uh, well, I guess... Well, you're right. What spurred my leaving was, was two twofold. One was that we weren't getting enough subscribers, enough people that were chipping in and trying to keep me in a home <laughs> so that I could continue doing the shows. Right. And secondly, since that had occurred, I decided the best thing for us to do was to try and take 2012, get a big school bus, and just start driving around the United States to show people the goodness of humanity while everybody was caught up in this end of the world fear propaganda. Right, right. So what's interesting is is you, you spent a lot of time early getting online and in some ways twenty twelve has been about being offline for you. Which is kind yeah. of intri- kind of intriguing. Um let's talk a little bit about, about synchronicity because I think it's a it's a fascinating subject in uh strange attraction and all those things that happen in the quantum universe that, that are entirely unexplainable. Uh, maybe you could share, and I know synchronicity is kind of a personal thing. I mean, you know, it's like what has meaning for one person may not have meaning for for another person, but then there are also these archetypal moments that really pop through with synchronicity. We can all get that kind of head nod and go, yeah, yeah, I get that. But maybe you could share one or two really interesting synchronicities that have occurred while you've been out on the road. Yeah, you know, and I wonder if it requires uh, the despair or the, uh, you know, the fear to to bring it about. I've been trying to learn how to produce synchronicities, as it were, without the the desperation. Because usually when something uh, miraculous like this comes into your life, it's because you need something to happen right then and there. Right. Uh, so this is mostly the way my synchronicities have fallen. But for a couple of examples that I find just mind-blowing, uh, I was following the Grateful Dead or Fish or String Cheese or Widespread Panic. I don't know. I followed them all. Uh, and <laughs> all of my friends were leaving tour. We were at this random apartment somewhere. I don't even know where I was. 
and I needed to get to Florida. I think I was in North Carolina, and I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to do this, and all the people I know, they're all leaving, going different directions, and I'm about to be left standing alone. And I'm like, wow, i got to get to Florida. What am I going to do? i got to get to this other festival so I can meet with my friends, and then they're going to take me the rest of the way, but how do I get there? Now, I'm in a, a stranger's apartment, and the phone rings. And lo and behold, it's this girl calling up to find if there's someone that could go with her to this festival in Florida. She needs a gas rider. And, of course, there I was. Right. So there's, you know, just boom, uh, a random person at a at a, at a um you know, a house, a stranger's house, and everything I needed right there. Or one of my favorites, uh, when we landed back in Kansas and we needed to make it to this jazz festival in Colorado, had a dollar to our name. Now, when I'm running like this, even now, you know, we live day by day, so there's usually, you know, you got as much as you got to get where you're going, if you do, and then that's it. Or, you know, you go as far as you can. Yeah. So... Uh, we landed in Kansas again after, uh, well, this was actually 1996 during the IMFWTO protest, and we had just protested Washington, D.C. with 500,000 other people and witnessed some amazing, uh, scary events there, watching 600 people get arrested by riot squads for just walking down the street. And, you know, the protests that I've done since 93 have been pretty incredible and pretty huge. But we finished all that. We ended up back in Kansas, and we needed to get to Colorado. All of a sudden, a friend rolls up. We're at a Perkins restaurant. A friend rolls up and says, well, I'm trying to get to Colorado. I see you have a van. Can I pay your gas the whole way uh, if you move my family? And I'm like, sure. (laughs) And there's one catch. We have to go to this jazz festival. And, of course, he says, well, that's where we're going. Oh, wow. There you go. are little things, uh, but so miraculous, like, that give you goosebumps. And I could go on and on for days about stories like these. Yeah, yeah. So for you, I mean, this brings up an interesting sort of topic. Uh, Synchronicity as a kind of an individual experience and an individual flavor. So for you, it's kind of an 11th hour experience, right? For somebody else, it might be something completely different. Right. um, And it could be maybe a harbinger of things to come, or for another person, it could be uh, sort of a clue uh, as to some, you know, larger mystery that's unfolding in their lives. So it's a really fascinating sort of take on, on synchronicity. So anything on this current tour where you're out there, you know, spreading the love and the light amongst your brothers and sisters, anything else happen that's been kind of unique or interesting? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, strangely, the synchronicities haven't been as uh, dramatic because we haven't been in need. We've we've got a golden ticket, I guess, where we have friends waiting for us on every end of the strip, and mm-hmm. you know everything is beautiful. It couldn't have worked better. So I can't even tell you where the synchronicities occurred because it's all been just perfect. Right. Uh, but along these trips and travels, I mean, my God, the things that we have seen, we've been to every Occupy movement that there was. Uh, we've been to all the different Mason temples. And, of course, we're filming all of this and sharing it on freemantv.com. Mm-hmm. So you can go watch our our Mystery School Mobile Media Lab experiment or Miss Emily uh, travel around with uh, with us, and you can see everything we see. I mean, we found the Ark of the Covenant We've seen Jesus crucified. We found the Ten Commandments in New Mexico. We've met uh, Tesla scientists, Vortex scientists, Vortex mathematicians, I should say, uh, NASA scientists, witches, uh, Satanists, Christians. And the, the people we have been meeting have been amazing. And the things that we have seen, incredible. Uh, it's just it's a mind blower. I'm trying to think of uh, some more of the most amazing tales that we've seen. We've just seen so much and been so many places. It's if people knew, if people knew how easy it was for them to just leave, to just you know say, "Ah, I, I quit this job. I'm just wandering." And if they realize that these the path is open for you, if you're if you're open, good, kind, and 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 a, a nice person, you know, if you're friendly, you can go anywhere and meet anyone. You don't need to be Freeman to do this. I've done this long before I was ever known on the Internet. 
So people can just kind of break their bounds and leave and go find a new life that's more fulfilling for them if they trust in the process, if they allow it to flow. Right. There's a certain mindset that the traveler has to cultivate, you know, the wanderer, because uh, you can't go into any situation with any amount of arrogance or hubris or pride. I mean, that's really sort of rule number one of the road. Isn't that right? Exactly right. That's the the biggest piece of the puzzle. And the, the curious thing is, is I bring people with me so that I can share with them what it's like to have these, these miracles unfold in their lives. And typically I'll take someone that's never traveled before, maybe never even seen a mountain before, and I'll share this with them. And I watch as many people start to panic uh, because there's no foundational standard to, to go on. Uh, they have to completely rely on me and trust me to do this. And I, I, most of them fail. Most of them can last, mm, I don't know, until the first breakdown, really, you know, and then it's like, oh, my God, panic and run. Right. And they'll take bus home. They'll do whatever necessary. I'll fix whatever the problem is and carry on. Yeah. Uh, so I have seen where people have a chip on their shoulder and won't be welcome in the places that I've been welcome. Even though they're friendly and whatever, it just, you know, it's just something about them irks the other people and they won't, they don't follow the same flow. They think they deserve it, whereas instead you have to be, well, friendship becomes your currency. And that's what we've started with the friendship agenda. So now we have a, a new social network site called friendshipagenda.com. And we're trying to bring all of these people together in one little place so that we can all share with each other. And then everyone inside of friendshipagenda.com is welcoming to any other members to come and visit. Mm -hmm. So that's really been working out. Uh, as we've traveled around, we've made sure that all the people we meet meet each other. And we've built lasting relationships everywhere we've gone, leaving them with lasting relationships around them. Right, because what we hear most of the time is, I can't talk to anyone about this stuff. And so we're like, well, we know these people and these people here. You know, now you all meet. Yeah, uh, yeah it absolutely takes a very particular mindset to be under someone else's care. You know, we get invited into people's homes. And mm -hmm. so you've got to have that kind of mindset where you're the guest, you're, you're taking care of them, they're taking care of you. It's a real give and, and receive situation. It, it, it works out so well because these people really want someone to come and interrupt their life. Mm -hmm. And we really want to come in and enjoy what they have to offer. So it all works out. You also have to be prepared to deal with a certain amount of weirdness too, right? Because, you know, I mean, most people are, are generally good, but that doesn't mean that they're not quirky or have some interesting eccentricities. And when you get into their space, all of a sudden, you know, they show you their, you know, uh, stuffed ferret, you know, collection. It's like, oh, <laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? Yeah, very cool. And how did you meet these ferrets? And, oh, do they have names, right? I mean, you know, you just have, you have, you have to open your aperture, right? To, you know, for a certain amount of allowance in these experiences as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, when you're Freeman and you're showing up at your, your fans' houses, I also have to be prepared for them to have a whole list of questions for me. Right. Or release their conspiracy theories upon me, uh, you know, in an unending tirade. And that can get uh, kind of tiring, you know, it really can. And, it's it's amazing and exciting, but then day after day after day, going to next house, next house, next house, it starts to get a bit wearing. Right. Uh, but it's it's amazing and fun at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this as a model for social change on some level, right? Because this is like what you're really, you know, kind of getting at in in your own very clever uh, and and creative way are are going about doing. I mean, this whole notion of walking away from things to me is really interesting. And for the last year and a half or so, I've been touting, um, you know, if you want to change the world, just stay home, you know. And, and I mean that in a much broader sense. I mean, that would be staying home and not shopping and staying home and not going to work and staying home and not taking your kids to school, just basically saying no to the dominant paradigm and then having a bunch of other people saying no to the dominant paradigm. And then just see what shows up. Because at that point, then, then I think it gets really interesting. It's like, wow, 
we've just decided to say no and not play this game. Well, what do we want to do now? You know, and I, and, and I think maybe what you're getting at here is something very close to that. In your own way, you've just decided, hey, I'm not playing the game. I'm, I'm hitting the road, and I'm, I'm allowing Grace to come in and, and uh, participate in all this. What's your thoughts on that, Freeman? Well, in 1999, I decided to give up, and my motto has been quit your job, save the world. Yeah. And many people don't really fully understand what I mean by this. And, of course, they think, uh, you know, it, well, you can't do this individually. It would take it would take a global network to quit their jobs to save the world. But the the purpose being that we've shown that nothing is real. So in '99, I was I was telling people about the Y2K situation. I was talking about the uh, capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. I was talking about how things were going to change with HARP and weather modification, and that how. Uh, things were going to change where you could no longer trust your own emotions. We weren't heavily into chemtrails then, but they were going. You know, I, yeah. I dated those about 1996 for the beginning of the real chemtrail campaign. Yep. So I was talking about all of this stuff and working at Kansas University. And at this point, I, I was like, none of this is real. I I I, I predicted that. Uh, after Bill Clinton was taken out of power over an extramarital affair, you know, this to me was psychological warfare. I knew immediately that this was a plan, a setup, because they don't yeah. they don't destroy the character of our president like this unless they have a reason. Right. Uh, they would never ever do this to anyone. I mean, many of our presidents had affairs. We didn't see impeachment trials come out of it. That's right. So. They brought this to our attention, and I knew that back then. And I said, well, what they're going to do to further destroy our belief in our own system is to force a president into office. And they're going to force this guy named W into office because W is the letter of the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. And as I watched all of my predictions come to light, come true, everything fell right into play exactly as I said it would. I said, none of this is real. Uh, we're participating in a false system, so I am just going to leave this system and go. <clears throat> and that's when I found uh, – well, I haven't had a job since. Let's just put it that way. Since 1999, I've yet to sign another W-2, fill out another application, submit my application for registration or anything. Right. Uh, and it has all worked out for me, and I am now – doing something that actually is helping, bettering the world, making myself a stronger person, and also just bringing a global change on my own, you know, trying to, to teach people what I'm showing, you know, what, what we're talking about here. Right, right. You also said, as, as part of this presidential continuum, you also predicted the, uh, the Obama insertion, and, um, and then all the attendant sort of strangeness and illusion around his his birth and and all that other stuff. We can get into Obama in a minute. But um, this election that's coming up is really tricky. It's tricky from an astrological perspective because it's going to be held on a Mercury retrograde in Scorpio, which is very intense, by the way, um, and nothing is as it seems. And Obama, when he was uh, in, when he was sworn into office, of course, he had that dog and pony show with John Roberts during a void of course moon and a Mercury retrograde where they, you know, flubbed the signing in and then went down into the into the uh, basement of the White House and then did their whole other signing in on a very different Bible. But but we're coming up on this election and it's we're in really tricky territory here. Do you think that we're actually going to have an election or do you think something's going to happen? And this is going to get postponed, martial law, and Obama indefinitely. What's your take on that? All right. So, yeah, we have been watching this situation unfold. And as you say, I did predict the birther movement, saying that the next president's eligibility would be questioned. I, I posted this while W was in office and had never heard of Barack Obama at this point. I just knew that the next, after forcing a president into office, they would mean then the next president to be considered ineligible. This was to open up a constitutional convention so that they can re-script the Constitution, or at least this is what I had believed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as it unfolded, I'm blown away, you know, and I'm seeing Donald Trump promote the birther, and I'm seeing now Romney. Um, so I'm seeing that plan still 
working itself out. But at the same time, I'm trying to calculate because what I do is I take the political and I mix it with the esoteric and I try to to suss out what's going to come from this. So for this next election, I I have had a lot of concerns about what may happen because there was uh, executive orders put into place to remove the 22nd Amendment, to remove uh, the limits to terms of presidency. So this would make, you know, Barack an emperor. Right. Of course, I have my, my feelings on him being a clone of an ancient pharaoh, and this may play into the puzzle as well as he does become emperor. But what I've been watching is the idea that uh, Albert Pike laid out back in the 1800s when he outlined the three world wars necessary can, to can, bring can I Can I stop you just for one second there, okay? Because I actually pulled this up and was going to talk about this with you, and I actually have it right in front of me. Can I read it? And then you can can jump into it? Okay. This is what Pike said. This is what he said. He said, the Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agentur of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionism, the state of Israel, Mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economic exhaustion. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out In the public view, this manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement, which will allow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. So I I had a feeling we would go in this direction and talk about this. I pulled it. And how is this related to where we are now, Freeman? Well, as you were saying, so Barack Obama then retook his oath, and when, when he stepped out of that secret chamber... Uh, they, he, the only quote they got from him was, "Yeah, I took the, I retook the oath, but I forgot my Bible." And so there was one tick on the the anti-Christian uh, Christian atheist warfare. Uh, then, during the inauguration, each of the ministers that he had say prayers at the inauguration were disallowed to use the name Jesus Christ in their prayers. Now, this was said that it was because the atheists were angry. And, of course, they they propagate all of this through the media so that you will will feel these these fights in between. So here we had atheists saying, we don't want the name of Jesus Christ used in the inaugural prayers, and then the government going okay with this, right? So then the, the ministers had to use very curious names for the for their Lord and Savior. So the gay Episcopal minister that gave a prayer, he said, you know, uh, he he signed off to the Lord of many understandings. Uh, I guess if you're a gay priest, you know. Uh, And and then I think it was Warren Black, he came out and said, uh, the Lord of all nations, which I thought was very interesting because it was Satan that offered all the nations to Jesus. and, And so who is the Lord of all nations? Right. And so we see this play on this whole situation where they're, they're, you know, they're fomenting the warfare between the atheists and the, and the Christians, just as Albert Pike said. Yeah. So then I began to, to look at the Zionist Muslim connection and see how this could play out. Uh, I am very concerned about actually an Israel Egypt war. I think this is something that people aren't really looking at and thinking about, but uh, that might be a potential right there. But what I saw was, um, oh, where is it? (laughs) I threw in that Israel-Egypt war, and it threw off my train. Uh, 
what I saw was that they were what what I what I expected out of it was for the Pope to go and take the Temple Mount, mm-hmm. and I had se- selected a date of the Fourth of July, and this being because that's the day that the Templars lost the Temple Mount, and also it's the day that Sirius is in conjunction with the Sun, mm-hmm. and so this is a very important moment for the Illuminati, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, as soon as I began talking about the Pope taking the Temple Mount, Pope Benedict was the first pontiff to ever visit the Temple Mount. And right as I was saying it live on London television, it was actually happening in real time. But they did not make any moves to take the Temple Mount yet, but the Pope did visit, and he was the first to ever do so. And I started seeing the inner playings working out. So I saw that as a potential... Uh, key point to start spark the Muslim Zionist warfare and all of this. Right. And of course, the nihilists and atheists, you know, we can see that coming up just through the media stream and, and how they're uh, pred- promoting, well, Lady Gaga's ideas and uh, the idea of you were born this way, right? This is yeah. a very statement because this is giving everybody an excuse. So just as being uh, uh, identified as having ADD or ADHD or any of these, the children then use that as an excuse. I'm sorry, I've been uh, diagnosed with this problem. I can't control myself. So born this way, something Lady Gaga and even Barack Obama has has opened for Lady Gaga saying this, uh, that is a very dangerous threat. And then the other thing is to say, I deserve this. And... Uh, these two statements, I think, are what are, are fueling the nihilists to, to be uh, feel safe and secure in their own <laughs> mental disturbances. Right, right. What's also interesting is coming from another angle, like from the, the zeitgeist angle, right? I mean, you there you, there are all these people that are really turned on the zeitgeist, which has some interesting ideas, but also has some other ideas that are um, a little disturbing in their own right. Like when you get into this whole notion of the Venus project and the earth's load and, you know, agenda 21 and how it all kind of dovetails in a very, you know, uh, very, very tight knit uh, sort of fashion. Um, There's this whole narrative, which I think was supplied or inspired um, by uh, uh, Russell Pines, uh, who is, (laughs) I got his real name. I'm blanking out. Jordan Maxwell is supplied by Jordan Maxwell, which is this whole, whole notion of, Jesus as Osiris, you know, or Ra, or or any number of solar deities, right? So it's this astro theology, which which has become a very sort of potent meme. It's not necessarily an atheistic meme, although the atheists have like jumped on it. But there's also people that are kind of in the the you know the extraterrestrial Anunnaki seeding. Of the world, um, you know, Jesus was uh, Anunnaki, perhaps. I mean, there's this whole other kind of vector which is disassembling this notion of Christianity, which is interesting and also disturbing at the same time. Like, you can't even talk to these people. You know, it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something else going on. No, no, no. They don't want to hear it. They don't. Want, you know, they're they're just as militant as a Christian who is promoting, you know, whatever version of Jesus they're into. You know, have you noticed this as well? I don't come across that in my reality too much, like on a personal level. I do absolutely look into the research of it. Yeah. And I want to say that tomorrow uh, I will be at UFOCon, and I'll be meeting up with Jordan Maxwell and a number of others like Lord, Laura Eisenhower and Andrew Bisago and Alfred Weber and others. So tomorrow I will be in the free section at UFOCon. If anyone wants to show up, it's linked up on freemantv.com. And we can talk to Jordan ourselves about this. Uh, he does respect my work a lot. I've got to talk with him quite a bit. And uh, so I hope tomorrow goes well with that. Where is, uh, that? Where, where is UFOCon? I would have to look it up. <laughs> uh, let's, it's Santa Clara at okay. the Marriott Hotel. Okay. You so if you're, if you're if you're in, if you're in the area, Santa Clara is in the Bay Area. It's in the South Bay. It's actually the heart of Silicon Valley. So um, there you go. You'll be showing up there. Uh, that'll be interesting. 
So anyway, we're so we've got this thing going on now. We've got this we've got this conflagration which has been triggered in the Middle East and in North Africa, which is really where it's happening now. Um, and it was and it was triggered by this film, this low budget film, and by a guy who goes by about four different aliases, and uh, is in hiding now. And what's interesting about this film and what happened in the uh, embassy uh, is that they knew that that this attack was going down. Apparently, this is kind of like a it's it's turning into a bit like Pearl Harbor. They knew that the attack was going down, and they. They did nothing, and they were also apparently the Marines were given blanks in their in their rifles. It's it's a, it's a very strange scenario, and feels very much like a false flag. Have you have you spent much time dissecting this one? No, no. Um, yeah, you, you got me thinking about the the Aurora shooting though, uh, and the idea that. This was another uh, basic prediction I had said. Now, this is, I guess, off the topic of what you're bringing up because I, I'm, I don't have any knowledge on what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so we, we can uh, get into Aurora. That. Aurora is fascinating and dark, and let's let, let's go there. All right. Uh, so when we were talking about the nihilists and the atheists and the way that this was coming up, I started witnessing the, the dark hero programming and what we call princess warrior programming, mm -hmm. so that people think that toys and, and pop culture and all of this are just the outcome of human endeavor. These are the things that people want and that this is just the way life had turned out. But this is just not the truth. There is a filter that allows what rises, and this filter is the secret societies, most likely the Freemasons, most likely the Scottish Rite Freemasons, if we want to get most specific. Uh, and so as you walk down your store aisles in Target, Walmart, wherever, you'll see in your children's aisles that the boys are all programmed to kill. They're mm -hmm. all programmed for warfare with Clone Wars, Transformers, G.I. Joe, uh, even uh, UFC, which blew my mind to see, uh, you know, ultimate fighting championship toys in Walmart. Uh, you know, this is the bloodiest thing we've ever seen on television, and I can't believe there's toys to go along with it. So, and then on your, your female aisle and the girls' aisle, you'll see all of the pink little bubblegum cell phones and the bling and the things that they need to buy so that they're, the boys have to go to war to pay for the girls' bling, right? Yeah. And so this print for your programming coming out. So as we watched, I saw in in Y2K again where they killed off the superheroes. They killed Superman. They killed Batman. And they replaced both of them. Right. And Superman became six clones. And one of his clones, the one that was the main character they kept running, was a black a Superman in a full black outfit with, with weapons, with guns. Now, what did Superman need with guns? What happened right. to his cape? Where's his yeah. tiny blue outfit? You know, now he's in a black militant outfit with guns. Yeah. Uh, this is how Superman changed. But, of course, no one really took to these clones. Uh, instead, they decided that it was better to go with the new comic, which was Image, which brought out a new Superman, which was known as Hellspawn, who fought rapist pedophiles in the comic book. Uh, <laughs> Superman turning into Hellspawn. Well, then Batman, or Bruce Wayne, had his back broken by Bane. Now, this was the, the latest movie, The Dark Knight Rises, but it was a comic book way back in Y2K. I have the whole collection, The Death of Batman, or The Breaking of Batman, really. He didn't die. He had his back broken. But mm -hmm. he was played by a character known as Azrael. You know, of course, Azrael is the fallen angel that fallen came angel. and everything to humanity and Enoch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Taking over our heroes' uh, layers and also becoming militant. Uh, the new Batman, Azrael, when he took over the Bat mantle, he, he began ripping out people's spines and killing people, and this freaked all the, the fans out, you know, because Batman was never a killer. He's always the detective. And they actually had to have Bruce Wayne come back and battle Azrael to take the Bat mantle back. A lot of this was left out of the movie. I wonder if it'll come out in the next one. 
But so the dark warrior programming, the dark hero programming, we see consistently coming up where the the lines of good and evil are being blurred. And most of our heroes now are dark characters. Uh, this this we've watched through through childhood with the death of the mother. Now this is the same kind of story that you would get with uh, with Darth Vader, where the mother is killed, so the character becomes evil. Right. Uh, right. Then you have more layers in this, where like, you go to Finding Nemo. You know, uh, nice little cartoon. Of course, his mother's slaughtered in the first five minutes of the film. Of course, you go to any Disney film, and you'll find the mother slaughtered in the first five minutes of the film. You know, there's a whole list from Bambi, Dumbo, uh, while well, he's ripped from his mother and Dumbo, and Finding Nemo. Uh, the list goes on and on of how they are programming the children through Walt Disney, especially. I mean, Disney and Spielberg and Lucas are really the three main programmers of America, or of the world, I should say. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, but it was it was really it was interesting. But we were, we were talking about this the the princess and the and the warrior programming. Mean, now what you have is you have this sort of cross bleed of the of the princess warrior programming, right? I mean now now print, the princess isn't just you know uh, prancing around with a little wand and a star in the end. Yeah, you know, she's kicking ass now, right? I mean, this is a whole nother uh, meme that's been put into the system. And in fact, I was watching the uh, uh, the video that, uh, that Katy Perry did recently, where she joins the Marines. Have you seen that video? Yeah, I'm wide awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I have to study a lot of Katy Perry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry and uh that. you know, a lot of these layers because uh a lot of it's being set up, thrown out there and put out. So you have Beyonce coming out on on the um Grammys with riot squads as her dancers. Yeah. And of course they couldn't dance in those riot squad outfits, but why was she up there with riot squads? We have Hannah Montana coming out in her breakout from Hannah Montana to becoming Miley Cyrus. And she uh, she comes out of a trailer at the Teen Choice Awards, you know, to show how lowly you are. And then comes out and steps on a stripper pole, starts dancing up on the pole, uh, then becomes the superstar. Now, this is the opening sequence of her performance at the Teen Choice Awards. So you can imagine her on an ice cream cart doing stripper moves on a stripper pole in front of all of these teens and tweens. Um, and then it, it goes on and on in this way where Lady Gaga is performing full blood rituals on American Idol and on the, the DMA Awards or MTV Awards. And we're watching as they're performing these rituals right in front of all of us and also doing the programming because Anna Nicole Smith had the same programming out of a trailer onto a strip pole, find a Nazi millionaire. Right. You know, it's, <laughs> it's the the program that they tell them. And of course, when we go back to the the uh, fairy tale script, once the the woman becomes married, there's no more story. That's it. The story's over. So that's where you start getting your bridezilla programming and all of this craziness, because that one day is the full day of the event of their entire life, and after that, it's all over because the fairy tale ends always with the marriage and never with the story after there's never actually a happy ever after you just get the end of the pale because the women are not given any kind of, of strong supportive roles in these films. Uh, they are usually underlings. Uh, you know, if we look at Walt Disney himself, he really had a disrespect for women. They mm-hmm. would, were not allowed to work in the artistry. They were only allowed as, as colorers. They could have been replaced by monkeys uh, you know, the women that he had were scorned and, and attacked. So if we just look at Disney himself and, and how he treated the women back in the beginning of the creation of Walt Disney World. Now, if you don't understand why I harp on Disney, realize that they are a military-industrial complex corporation, that every ride inside of Disney World is sponsored by a military uh, corporation. So Siemens runs the giant ball that you ride in in Epcot, and you'll go look at Auschwitz pictures, and you'll see Siemens' corporate logo over Auschwitz. Martin Marietta has a ride inside of Disney World. My dad built nuclear missiles 
for Martin Marietta. I could go on and on. Every ride you go in is sponsoring a military industrial corporation. Uh, when, when you walk in Disney, you give them your credit card information, and they say, okay, thank you for your hundreds of dollars. Now give us your fingerprint to right. enter the door, and then go into the big ball that's sponsored by Siemens, and we're going to take your photograph and ask you where you live. So now you've given them your entire biometrics and also your address and everything else before you've even spent 10 minutes inside of the theme park. This is what Disney is for. Yeah. The programming that they use, all of the propaganda, the reason that you'll constantly see Hannah Montana's face everywhere inside of your store aisles. If you don't know, go to the section on freemantv.com called Hollywood Mind Control and start to look down. And at the bottom of the page there, I have our shopping of Hannah Montana products. And you'll start to realize how this programming goes because – now, Hannah Montana there, as we're talking, is, is the sign for, for girls that they are the lowly person. You are just the poor little uh, Miley Cyrus. But what you want to be is this Hannah Montana. And so it shows the dichotomy of the elite. So you can see there's the lowly you and then there's the elite. And this is the programming that comes in. Never mind the plot inside of the TV show. All of that's irrelevant. But a lot of times, the plot is the relevancy. People are looking for subliminal programming coming out of these things when actually it's all right there in front of you. If you look at something like The Little Mermaid and you find that she has sold her soul to the Black Witch in order to have enough talent to be impressive for her uh, male that doesn't care about her. Right. Uh, this is the type of programming that goes in. Hunger Games. Now we've got children killing children and, of course, the lead role being feminine. Right. Uh, yeah, they and that's the, that's the morphing of the warrior princess. With, with and we're you know we're seeing more and more of that, and and it's also linked to this. You know, I don't need a man. It's not like okay, well, you know, relationships are are valuable and they're worth exploring. Uh, no, I don't need a man. I'm independent. You know, screw that. I'm going to join the Marines, or you know, I'm going to I'm going to kill people for you know, for, uh, for my district in the Hunger Games. And, 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 and it's this reshaping of, of the psyche uh, that is uh, really strange and, and disturbing, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah, we get a lot of flack about talking about the homosexual programming because then people that are homosexual think we're attacking them. Yeah. But I want to bring it up anyway because – it's, it is a program in there to to bring about this uh, the split gender and and yeah the whole idea of not needing the other the other side and so you go to ABC which of course is Walt Disney again never forget this and and ABC has the new family and we are creating the new image of the family and of course it's all homosexual. Now I'm, you know, I don't care about people's personal choices. I, I, you know, friends, friends are friends, right? But when I'm watching a sociological programming, then I find it an issue, and I want to tell people about this. So, yep, a lot of homosexual programming is there, intended just for this separation as well, to start to split the 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 families apart. Now I'm about to be in a film called Don Peyote. And this is made by uh, actor Don, or Dan Fogler, who was in Disney's Mars Needs Moms. Now, so uh, Don Peyote should come out. Well, I'm hoping it comes out in 2012, and I'm hoping it makes it to theaters, but who knows. But I have a pretty good role inside of that movie, and I'm pretty excited about it. But Dan Fogler was in Mars Needs Moms, which was yanked out of the theaters early. And it turned out we were filming with Dan at the same time he was filming Mars Needs Moms, and he started to question us about this. And, of course, we hit him up right away with the whole Disney kills the mom right off the bat. And then we're like, well, what Disney film are you in? And he's like, well, uh, Mars Needs Moms, <laughs> you know, because uh -huh. they killed the mom in the, in the film. But the outcome of this film was, was that there was a family unit. The Martians learned that they actually used to live in family units and that they had a mother, a daughter, a father, and a son. And this was something they had never experienced in their lifetime because they had all been, well, the boys were all thrown into the trash and the girls were all programmed by militant robots. And this, But then in the end, they find that the family unit is the core. This family unit then unifies all of the people. They let the boys back into the situation. Everybody becomes good. And they kick out the militant overlords. And this film, Mars Needs Moms, 
got yanked from the theaters. And we honestly believe that it was yanked early because it sent such a positive message. And mm-hmm. they said, oh, my God, wait, we screwed up in our programming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I remember when that movie came out because I, I have a son uh, who is uh, young and, and – uh, you know, I take him to movies, and I have to kind of be very selective about what I take him to. And um, I remember seeing the trailer, and I do remember seeing sort of the death of the mother in that trailer. It, 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 yeah, it was interesting. This whole Miley Cyrus thing is fascinating in that she's the first Disney character to be a sort of born and bred from cradle to the grave, not just on TV but on the Internet as well. I mean, if you look back at Christine Aguilera, Christine Aguilera and uh, Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears, who were sort of the first version um, of that, um, kind of morphing the character from innocence and trust into experience and degradation, uh, they're kind of pre-internet, actually. They're really, you know, more cable TV. But, but, Chris, uh, but Miley Cyrus is interesting because she is there from the start of the internet pretty much for a lot of these young kids all the way up through till now. So her, her reach is pretty pervasive in terms of um, their psyche. I found it amazing that when the swine flu came out, which I got, uh, when the swine, swine flu came out, there was Hannah Montana hand sanitizer and every Walgreens, Walmart, and Target you can imagine, just buckets of this stuff. Yeah. You know, so come on. I mean, really, you know, think of it. Think of what did it take to have Disney to be prepared with all of these Hannah Montana hand sanitizers if this isn't all a scheduled program. Right. Uh, but, yes, this uh, it, it is, it's very interesting to watch the, the change in research. So when I began research in 93, you know, there wasn't an Internet. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't like we have today. It wasn't really until like 99 that I had gotten into it. So we're talking to another six years where we had AOL, which, of course, was Time Warner, I and the Pyramid symbolism, back to the Illuminati and all of that, Yeah. uh, that we couldn't do this kind of research. There weren't any websites that had any of this data in it or anything. It's such a curious way that things have changed. You know, I've been doing this since before YouTube, right? Yeah, and uh, I used to go into AOL chat rooms and try and talk to people, and and I could clear a chat room in five minutes or less. <laughs> you know, I should talk about anything of importance, right? And now, now it's gotten to the point where you can pick an opinion and go with it, because mm-hmm. you can find the opinion you want on the internet, no matter what you want. If you want to debunk something, then there you go. If you wanna, if you wanna believe in something, there you go. It doesn't matter right now. Nothing is real anymore. It's all opinion. And then people are now conditioned to believe opinions as facts. And I found this kind of through the indoctrination of school where we're uh, faulted for not giving an answer, for not knowing, and you're, you're praised for giving any answer as long as it was something. Even if it's because wrong. Even if it's a wrong answer. Wrong, exactly. Yeah. We've been conditioned to believe opinion and and quit thinking. I I think back to 1999 when I was teaching people about HARP at the Kansas University, and I was bringing in all the government documents, not to mention I was also bringing in like FEMA and DOD documents saying that you should prepare for three days in case the Y2K meltdown actually occurred, which was something I was kind of hoping would happen myself. Right. they would say, oh, you can't believe what you read on the Internet, you know. I'm like, but it's .gov, you know. This is your government telling you to prepare. You, or uh, as I brought them all the documents on HARP and we're showing them that, and they were like, ah, you know, you can't believe what you read on the Internet. And then it showed up on the news, USA Today, right there on the front page. It says Milosevic. Now, this is way back, right? Milosevic accuses the U.S. of using HARP technologies to cause earthquakes and floods in the Middle East. That yeah. was the headline on the USA Today. And they said, oh, you're just saying that. You know, and you're just like, oh, my God, I can't win. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. Plus, he's Milosevic, right? I mean, he's the, he's the white devil. And um, they, sure t- they sure took care of his ass, didn't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, Anna Nicole Smith, you got into her pretty deeply. 
And, uh, and it was amazing uh, watching that all unfold in real time on MTV. I mean, it was mind blowing. It, looking back on that whole event, you know, with Howard K. Stern and her son, her son's death, and I mean, it was just utterly surreal and bizarre. And it was programming, literal programming, and also, you know, figurative programming all happening at the same time. I mean, it, it, I'm not sure if we'll see anything like quite like that again. Uh, what, uh, give people some highlights or lowlights from that whole Anna Nicole's. And what's what's going on with her kids? You know. Well, I did not think I do not think they saw me coming at that point. Uh, I think that I don't think they expected us to do all this work for free, right, Robert? Yeah. I, I don't think they expected us to, to come out here and, and talk about this stuff over and over and, and spend all of our time trying to reveal these secrets because they weren't trying to cover it up so much back then, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, okay, so first of all, if you want to know the, the secrets of trauma-based mind control and how they are done, uh, you can simply watch the movie The Butterfly Effect. And this movie with Ashton Kusher will give you the step-by-step, step, blow blow-by-blow, how trauma-based mind control is, is done. Now, we start to see how the programming comes forward where, like, V for Vendetta shows you that trauma is actually your path out. So the answer to V for Vendetta is to be raped, imprisoned, beat, slaughtered, or not slaughtered, you want to live, uh, but raped, beaten, uh, traumatized, and then released. And you see that once she gave up on life altogether, that was when he said, ah, now you're free. Right. Uh, this is what they want to condition into the children, is that trauma actually liberates you from all of your uh, personal problems. Uh, so... When we get to the Anna Nicole story, this, oh, my God, this blew my mind. And what really blows me away is that I say these things, I outline these things, I have references and backup for what I believe, but then it just unfolds in the most ungodly manner. I mean, I can't believe that, uh, that like my Barack Obama story, how it unfolded and how the Anna Nicole story unfolded. But so a few key points of the Anna Nicole story uh, – and, and I'm flashing to Whitney Houston's death at this moment, too, because here she, her daughter, Whitney Houston, had, had drowned in the bathtub the night before Whitney drowned in the bathtub. And few people caught that. Right. And, and this was kind of another sort of ritual ceremony we saw here with the death of the mother and the, the trauma of the daughter and, and then them having a large party in the hotel and not allowing Whitney's body to be taken out of the hotel. Now, how unusual is that? How do you get a coroner to keep the body in a room so that you can have your party? I mean, this, oh, my God. You know, and for Clive how, Davis, too, and the guy who signed Whitney, Whitney Houston, who was her handler. I mean, that's, that's, you know, stacked. Right. And a lot of this, there were a lot of similarities in the story where the 911 calls were sent by weird people or un misunderstood. Or um, so what we have with Anna Nicole, as we started to look at this puzzle. Now, first of all, as we went over, she she married a a, a billionaire, right? And everybody yeah. just thought, of course, she went and married this 93 year old uh, billionaire so that he could get her money or she could get his money. But there was a clause written into the contract of their marriage, and, and no one, all of the legal entities that were trying to decipher it, could not figure out where the $93 million was going. Uh, it did end up riding over Danny Lynn, the, her, her daughter, over her head. And so she's got access, as far as I know, or is supplied by this money but does not own the money. So the, all the news could never explain who owned the money after this was all over. Mm -hmm. But when we look at Anna and Nicole, we can see the same programming coming out of the trailer, getting up on the stripper pole, uh, coming out and becoming a celebrity. Of course, a drugged up celebrity on there. Um, she was, well, okay, so she gets pregnant and no one knows who's the daddy, who's the daddy. This is a huge thing. And a number of people came out saying, actually, I'm the father. You know, you had Larry Burkhead. You had the potential of Howard K. Stern, although he was saying no. Mm -hmm. uh, and then 
strange man coming out of the blue, Prince Frederick von Anhalt. Uh, oh, God, I did not see this one coming. But so I, I go and investigate Prince Frederick von Anhalt because he says, actually, it was me that got Anna Nicole pre- uh, pregnant in this uh, party that no one will talk about and, and more likely like an eyes wide Question shot. Question eyes wide shot thing, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I have quoted live on television saying those very words, so you can see that it's true. And so I research Prince Frederick von Unholt a bit. Well, I find out that he keeps his wife, Zsa Zsa Gabor, locked up in his mansion with a padlock. Well, Zsa Zsa... <laughs> oh, man. Based mind control victims that were used in Hollywood against us, mm-hmm. uh, like Zsa Zsa Gabor, Marilyn Monroe, Anna Nicole. You know the story; it goes on, and she followed down the path. They always have one or many. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I find out, you know, here's this guy who keeps Zsa Zsa Gabor locked up in his mansion. So who is he? Who is Prince Frederick von Ostrom? And I start digging, digging, digging. And the most conclusive story I find is that he was actually a genetic experiment. Uh, to bring back Hitler's child. So uh, Hitler's semen, Adolf Hitler's semen, was saved. And this is a fact. And then they, you can see the movie The Boys from Brazil was made on this concept because then they started impregnating women with Hitler's semen to bring about the closest uh, child of Hitler they could come up with. Right. And what they did was grab Gretel Braun, who was Eva Braun's sister, now, Hitler had a relationship with Ava Braun, but she was gone, so they used Gretel. And they inseminated Gretel with, uh, with Hitler's semen and produced Prince Frederick von Anhalt. So he's actually Hitler's son. And then he impregnates Anna Nicole, according to himself, mm-hmm. and they give birth to Danny Lynn. Now, Danny Lynn is given... Um, uh, getting pregnant with with Danny Lynn, they they marry her off to J. Howard Marshall, this Nazi oil tycoon, and and so Danny Lynn, the granddaughter of Adolf Hitler, has been given this Nazi's billion dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Right. But this isn't all because we got to realize there is an esoteric potential to all of this, not just the political, but the esoteric, because the people in charge of our planet are magicians, or yes. what I would prefer to call as sorcerers. Mm-hmm. So they incorporate black magic rituals into this. So let's consider Scientology because uh, L. Ron Hubbard Jr. came out in Penthouse magazine saying that Scientology was a black magic ritual performed over a long period of time. Instead of getting a ritual in one setting, you will get it throughout your life in these different audits that they give in Scientology. He said, I was a a survived abortion, that L. Hubbard had created and aborted so many children that he couldn't even count, but somehow L. Ron Hubbard Jr. managed to squeak past the abortion and and live. So then he comes out and says, no, my father was evil, all of this is black magic, I was a survivor. And if you're in Scientology, you are practicing black magic and you are being programmed in a black magic ritual. Mm-hmm. More to this story. So as we start to look at Danny Lynn, Anna Nicole's daughter, we find that three days after she is born, her brother, Daniel Smith, is brought into the hospital room and strangely drops dead in front of the baby girl. Yeah. Is blamed on a drug overdose, just as they blamed for Michael Jackson. Just as <laughs> find that three months after that event, Anna Nicole dropped dead in front of the girl. So now we have two deaths: the death of the firstborn and the death of the mother, both within three months, which is magic. So you got three days and then three months, and uh, this baby. They are trying to put a, a moon child soul into this. Now, right. you'll find Disney as well. If you go to the Kane Chronicles, now remember who Kane is. And Disney, out, uh, like Percy Jackson, there's another series called the Kane Chronicles. And the children are being taught to invoke Osiris and Isis into their souls. In the same way, I believe they were attempting to create a moon child out of Danny Lynn which is what L. Ron Hubbard Jr. was saying L. Ron Hubbard was trying to do in Scientology and why he continually aborted the children because he could not get the soul to accept the 
spirit they were trying to place into it. Mm-hmm. Right. The, another interesting side note with uh, the the death of Anna Nicole and also her son is that in the very same resort where that uh, took place or, or around that resort, um, fast forward, John Travolta, Scientologist, loses his son in the same resort. So that was the, the Hard Rock Cafe in Florida. Uh huh. Is that and where? Hall- is, is that where? Is that where? Is that where Travolta's kid died? I thought it was at the resort. Uh, well, Anna Nicole. Anna Nicole. So it was her. But she was at that resort in Trinidad, where it was it Trinidad or no? It was Barbados, right? It was Barbados where her her son died. And and it's the same resort where John Travolta's kid died. Right. Yeah. We'll find a lot of these connections once you start to look into this puzzle. And and honestly, it was one of the most frightening studies I've ever done. And as you mentioned, Weird Stuff, our new magazine slash book that we're producing, and we'll have the Kickstarter going uh, probably Monday. So I hope everybody will come over and help start Kickstart, our Weird Stuff program because we're going to outline all of this, and we have all this. We already have 22 chapters written. It's going to be dynamic with with all of the imagery and the understanding, but what it's going to do is offer it to you in kind of a pop culture tabloid fashion, but give you all the data references and everything you need to understand this puzzle because it's a very dark image to look at. So we've kind of brightened it up a little bit, and you'll get all the dark stuff without us traumatizing you as well. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good uh, selling point, for lack of a better term. But it also, it also helps people digest the material. You know, I mean, I, I, was, I was married for seven years, and I was, you know, into this material, and I would, I would talk about it with my now ex-wife. And I knew that she wasn't ready to hear a lot of it, so I, w- I would talk about it in an ironic fashion so that she could at least begin to think about it in terms that weren't that threatening. And she, and she would say to me, well, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know if you're being truthful or real or whether you believe this or not. And I didn't want to come at her with a set of beliefs. I wanted to come at her with a, a set, you know, sense of curiosity. So I think it's a really good way to to approach the material. Have you heard this about this new movie coming out called The Master, Paul Thomas Anderson? Uh, it's it's essentially about the life of L. Ron Hubbard, and there's a character in the movie that's portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix, who of course is a victim of mind control and traumatization himself. And Joaquin Phoenix, I believe his character is based on Jack Parsons. Have you heard about this film? No, I know well, we'll be. Yeah, you should check it out, research it. It just got premiered, I think, down at the Venice Film Festival in L.A., generally positive um, reviews, although Tom Cruise was not happy about uh, the portrayal of the L. Ron Hubbard character, you know, who's being played by uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. But it's, 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 so now we're seeing this, this, whole, this whole thing now, the – the externalization of the hierarchy, right, or the revelation of the method. This is all taking place now right before our very eyes. So maybe you could chime in on that and, and tell people more about sort of this unveiling of, of the mystery, and the mystery sect that we're all seeing now. Yeah, they are ready to bring it to the surface. There's no doubt about that. And we can see this clearly with, with Lady Gaga in that it's just over the top. It's It's making it mainstream. We can hardly even talk about trauma-based mind control anymore because it's become so obvious or part of the art. So, you know, now it's just, oh, well, she's an artist. And and so that's part of the externalization where everybody just says, oh, that's just uh, the, the art, and that's the way it goes. Um, but we see this on many levels, on the political levels, as well as uh, they start to to unify their their strengths and and start to well let's see if i can paint a picture well enough of this uh because none of it's going to come straight forward and straight out at you it's it's all very subtle and then builds 
And for some reason, I feel the need to talk about Obama establishing the 10 regional governors under the UN, because this is kind of what I'm seeing. So as we witness the creation of the new world capitals, and people might not be aware of these, but I have them on my website, and I have a whole film about it. My latest DVD, E.T. and the Transhumanist Agenda, gets deep into what I'm talking about now, and that is these new world capitals. So when you go over to Kazakhstan, who has taken over all of the rocket launches to the International Space Station, uh, and SpaceX gets their dragon working right, uh, most, if not all, space or uh, International Space Station launches will go out of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has developed the uh, a pre-planned. Uh-oh, Prevent has dropped off. Just as we were getting into the uh, into the juicy information about Kazakhstan, which is a very interesting place, by the way, it's where the essentially the Khazars come out of um, the uh, the steppes and uh, move forward into Eastern Europe. And hopefully, Freeman will call back in, and we can talk more about this. This has been a great uh, hour and uh, twelve minutes. Anyway, he's back in there. Hey, what was that all about, man? Yeah, yeah. I guess we're getting close to the point here, huh? So because Kazakhstan is like and SpaceX. This is this is Kazakhstan is a fascinating place, absolutely fascinating. Um, so let's let's get back into that. Okay, well, have a look at Astana. Now I have a film called Twenty First Century Capital Warfare, and it's on my need, latest DVD. Uh, and you can also watch it free on FreemanTV.com. And you will see that they are establishing this new world capital. Mm-hmm. And it's not just Astana in Kazakhstan, but also Canberra in Australia, and then most likely uh, Colorado Springs or Denver as the other capitals. America is supposed to have two capitals, one in Atlanta and one in Colorado. So we'll see how that works out. Um, so when you look at these capitals, actually, when you go to Astana, you got to enter the city through the Pyramid of Peace. And it's this massive pyramid structure that you have to walk through to enter the city. And inside of there, they have the global religion forming. And they have a giant sundial table out there where all the, the religions gather around to discuss the global religion. And I'll tell you, most of those are Muslim. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you walk through this pyramid of peace and you get out into Astana. Now, this is a pre-planned city that was designed before it was laid out. And when you see it from an aerial view, you'll actually see that it is a seal of Solomon to bind a demon. Now, that's, go look at the Solomon grimoires, the Solomon, the magic of Solomon. Look into Solomon binding demons, mm-hmm. and uh, you will see the set of, of seals that he designed to, to, com- to bind and use the power of these demons. And that is the very layout of Astana, and then there's also a star chart that they used in the grimoire, and that is the layout for Canberra. Mm-hmm. So we have these cities already pre-planned. This came out of Walt Disney and Epcot being one of the first pre-planned cities, the experimental prototype civilization of tomorrow, Epcot. Uh, but Astana and Canberra are the new world capitals that are being engineered. And you'll see the blazing twin pillars of Freemasonry in Astana, and in the center of that, a big ball like what you see at Disney, only on a pole. And inside of that, there's a golden triangle with the architect's handprint pressed into it, uh, out of like something straight out of Total Recall. Now, this already exists. Astana is preparing to make the first indoor city. Uh, people, you know, and they look at Borat and they think Kazakhstan's a bunch of sheds and shacks and all these, you know, uh, incestuous people egging out. But that's not Kazakhstan, my friends. Uh, Astana is astonishing. And it yeah. actually, the name Threshold, where Canberra means meeting place. And that's where all of the unification of, like, the global network. So yesterday, uh, the Space Force, all right, people aren't aware, United States Space Force, like you have the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, you have the, the Space Force and Space Command. The United States Space Force yesterday launched a, a, a massive satellite array, uh, including a top secret NRO 36. So we're looking at the National Reconnaissance 
organization setting up this massive, it launched 13 satellites into the atmosphere yesterday. And this is a global grid to monitor everywhere, everywhere and everything. This, what they said is like, what they have is a giant flashlight at this point where they can illuminate massive areas. This new satellite that they launched yesterday will have the ability to really focus in on smaller areas, tracking anything and everyone. Mm-hmm. So that launched yesterday. I have a, a section called Space War News on my website on freemantv.com where you can follow all of this. And I've been tracking, well, what I think is going to be the manipulation for the end game. What we're looking at is kind of quote unquote Project Bluebeam. Mm-hmm. And I've been thinking as we've engineered incoming fireballs. And I tracked them and tracked them and tracked them, and I tracked all of the scientists that were saying, well, we don't know where these fireballs are coming from. There isn't even a meteor associated with it. We don't know what it is. And everybody was, and I've tracked all the news stories to prove this, up until the point that the military announced that incoming fireballs are now classified as secret. Mm -hmm. And then clips where the scientists are all up in arms about this. Why are you making fireballs secret? So I think that there is a big in-game show planned. It's going to include fireballs and probably, uh, you know, giant V-shaped craft, because I've witnessed these as well. I've mm-hmm. witnessed the fire myself. I've witnessed the V-shaped crafts myself. Uh, I know these things are, are here and in existence and are being used. The first fireballs I began tracking were all the way back in 99 when the first one flew over the heart facility as they were testing it as a meteor deflection shield. Mm. Now I track large green fireballs as incoming bolides, and I've been watching how then uh, the asteroids were the first part of the puzzle that they wanted to use to bring about this. uh, Well, it was Werner von Braun, the Nazi who came over and worked with Walt Disney and NASA and uh, Jack Parsons. To, to create and develop NASA and our rocket system. Uh, he laid out a program saying this is, through his, his secretary, Carol Rosen, mm-hmm. saying this is how to do it. It'll be the Red Scare, then it'll be terrorists, then it'll be asteroids followed by aliens. Mm-hmm. And none of them are actually a threat, he said. And he kept referring to universes instead of a single universe. So I began following just that plan uh, that Werner von Braun had outlined. And I said, look, the next threat after 9-11, and I predicted 9-11, after 9-11 is going to be asteroids. And so when Barack Obama came in office, I made a big poster of him as Akhenaten, the pharaoh, and I showed an asteroid towards his head and, and, you know, heading towards all the people running on the ground. I made poster before the threat was announced. So I put the poster out. I said, the next threat's asteroids. All of a sudden, lo and behold, they announced, oh, my God, there's an asteroid hurtling towards planet Earth. We're going to have to set up all the space weaponry. We're going to have to shoot out more uh, space-based space surveillance systems. And all of this stuff needs to happen to save us from this asteroid. An asteroid was called Apophis. Mm-hmm. And Ap- the Satan of Akhenaten's religion, who I was saying Obama was. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, it right into the programming, just as I was saying, and even more than I could have considered, I never thought they would name the asteroid after Akhenaten Satan. And so all of a sudden that poster came to life, and it all became real. Uh, So then the next part, of course, was the alien agenda and the idea of bringing in uh, the, the truth about aliens. So lo and behold, if the Royal Society, the UN, even the Vatican, all came out with alien ambassadors. We had (laughs) Mazion, the uh, UN's uh, little-known-about Office of Outer Space Affairs. Uh, She categorically denies being the alien ambassador, but that's still the position they've given her. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had... Uh, Linda Rothschild come out for NASA. She is their alien ambassador. Uh, Then we had two of the most curious characters, the Pope's uh, personal meteor curator and lead astronomer, uh, Cosigamo, I think I got his name right, Uh, and then um, uh, Reverend Fune, who was the one who came out and said that 
aliens are our space brothers and didn't suffer original sin because they weren't born of Eve and sh- should be considered our brethren. And the other one, Alessimo, God, I, I stumble over these Italian names, uh, that's the astronomy at the Vatican. Uh, he announced that he would baptize E.T. if he were to ever get one, and that he hoped that would. So these two Vatican astronomers that came out strongly of extraterrestrials openly uh, during the time that the Royal Society, the UN, and everybody else, NASA, were all coming out with their alien ambassadors, they suddenly were attached to CERN. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you fit into this puzzle? Do you go there? Wow. <clears throat> That's, uh, yeah, CERN, a.k.a. Stargate. Interesting. Yeah, so you know, these two these two Vatican astronomers were then attached to CERN as they launched the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which Gabriel Giffords was just at the uh, one year anniversary of, and her whole story along with her husband Mark Kelly, who was the one who flew flew the the curious Lisa Nowak mission, where she returned and went and tried to abduct another lady astronaut at the Orlando airport. You know, this to me would seem like some sort of alien hybrid program where she was trying to kill the breeder or something. I don't know. Nothing can explain why this astronaut, Lisa Nowak, came back from her space shuttle mission, strapped on a diaper, grabbed some implements of destruction, and raced from Houston to Orlando to abduct another astronaut woman who right. she said had sex with this other astronaut who was not. Uh, Gabriel Gifford's husband, and this whole story became very strange. Then, of course, uh, she gets shot. Gabriel Gifford gets right. shot at that whole scenario, and and now she's she's meeting up for the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And if you follow this space story, this is where it all really comes to a head. And what I found is that CERN is punching a hole into the other dimension. So. What uh, Werner von Braun had been saying was that the, the other universes he kept referring to. Well, now they're finding a hole into these other universes. Mm-hmm. And they've signified that other universe by the mark of the beast. And that is the OX symbolism, the very symbolism you'll see on X-Men, the very symbolism you'll see Madonna display at the Super Bowl, the right. very symbolism that the high priest of the Church of Satan has embedded into the back of his skull. It's, mm-hmm. it's all there, symbolism. It's even there when I try to sign in on my my email. <laughs> it, it's an OX server, and I'm just like, my God, this never ends. And OX can also be symbolized as VV, and that's how I got the W symbolism for the uh, for W for predu- for predicting he'd be forced into office. It is the letter of the fallen angels. It is the mark of the beast, and that is what we're seeing in the uh, CERN. Uh, symbolism of 666 with a hyperdimensional portal. Now they're going to punch a hole into the other dimension. Meanwhile, they're working out the technologies necessary to transmit your soul through a radio, via a radio frequency wave through this portal to another dimension. Now, you don't think that's possible? Well, right now, on the International Space Station stands Robonaut 2. Well, I use the term stands figuratively because uh, Robonaut has no legs. This is probably a safety feature. I'm not sure. But you can now, Robonaut 2 on the International Space Station is a telepresence robot. It is capable of receiving a mind transfer into its robotic body, and you can control the robot from Earth. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there are six adult stem cells. And, of course, this is the 19th time they've brought stem cells up to the International Space Station, seeking longevity, seeking immortality. So now we have the stem cell program, which Obama uh, released all the restrictions on federal funding to stem cell research, allowing for this human cloning for for, uh, experimentation. And we have... Uh, a telepresence robot. So we're at the moment that we see Battlestar Galactica begin. We have clones and drones going on. And also, if you look it up, you'll find that the uh, Wall Street Journal heralded Clone Wars, the Star Wars cartoon, as the best political commentary of our time, Mm -hmm. okay, because where we're at. And if we get 
this point where these men can then transmit their souls either into the other dimension through CERN or into a robotic body, or even Michael Jackson tried to transmit his soul into a robot named A-Rock. Uh, I guess that got so well. Um, once they reach this point, then we're, you know, we're in a real serious situation, especially if they can transmit their souls into another clone. And right. what I really believe, and this is the crux of the whole thing, is that when you enter a secret society, you are told to give your free will agreement. And that is it. You come of your own free will and accord. And that is what all of the propaganda that we've been talking about today, all of the, the programming that we're talking about, is to convince us, our, our soul, us, the, these uh, glorious beings that we are, are to give our, our free will agreement to these uh, nefarious characters and to the actions that they are doing. So whether we watch it on the news or in Hollywood or on a television show or just chat about it or whatever, we start giving our free will agreement to it all. Yeah, the planet's overpopulated. They should kill everyone. Okay, You just gave your free will agreement to the decimation and the destruction of all humanity because they're conditioning you to believe Earth first, right? They're hitting you as a child like dumpsters, you know? So this is the true key factor is that we're giving our free will agreement to all of this. And then once these people have been using their souls, selling their souls, ask any person in Hollywood whether or not they sold their soul to the devil, and you will see that that is the case. Just watch um, the video of uh, uh, We Sold Our Souls to Rock and Roll. You'll see every, every star say, yes, I sold my soul to Satan. Okay, so these people are the And the only way out of that problem is by transmitting their souls into robots or into clones is what they really hope for, and so that they can live and live and live and never actually have to pay that ticket, never actually have to give their souls over to Satan as they had promised. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, that's fascinating stuff. And, and they, have been, they have been absolutely working on this for at least the last 50 years. I mean, they, the, the research and the R&D, you know, started in earnest back when Uranus was in Aries. And this was back between 1926 and 1935. Uh, and, and this is, this, this is big time. This is really big time. And, and now we're seeing an acceleration of all this stuff. While at the same time, here's where I think it's really ironic Freeman is that, we're also seeing the dissemination of a 10th century religion. You know, I mean, uh, fundamental Islam is, you know, theoretically on the rise and being spread and encouraged uh, as it's a, it's a free, it's a free Masonic religion. I mean, fundamental Islam is, is a free Masonic creation and it binds people to a medieval uh, belief system in many ways. I mean, there's the esoteric, aspect of uh of islam and but at the same time uh it's a, it's a it's a fairly regressive um belief system and so now we've got this 10th century belief system and we've got this 22nd century uh technological rush taking place creating a massive field of cognitive dissonance on the planet and that's not just it's not just fundamentalist islam but it's also fundamentalist christianity and and, you know, all these kind of regressive ancient traditions um, that are being put forth right now that aren't, that aren't really that mind-expanding, to say the least. And we've got massive cognitive dissonance as a result. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what yeah. do we do? What do we do? Here we are. We're in the midst of all, all of this, you know, massive mind control, the programming, the esoteric agenda. You know, what do we do? How do we how do we how do we turn the tide? How do we how do we liberate ourselves from this the, the deepening of this consensual trance? Well definitely the hardest part is developing faith in humanity. And the biggest reason that this is so hard is that we're not communicating. We're not meeting one another. We're passing each other in these store aisles. We're walking past one another on the streets. Now as you know, I go to many rainbow gatherings, and this is where 20,000 to 30,000 people gather in the national forest in anarchy, and it works beautifully. 
You know, our, our new understanding of physics, of chaos, is showing us that chaos works beautifully in a beautiful pattern. That's where you get your Mandelbrots and your Julia scripts, and uh, it makes a beautiful uh, pattern, but it's all chaos. Uh, out at Rainbow Gatherings, all, all nationalities come together, all religions come together, everybody works for free, everybody creates, everybody loves one another, and the one thing that you'll notice when you leave the rainbow gathering is all of a sudden when you come back to the real world, beyond the fluorescent light bulbs, which are really bad when you first come out of the woods, uh, you find that no one's looking at you in the eye anymore. No one's saying, I love you anymore, which you'll hear repeatedly out at Rainbow, just a constant, I love you, I love you. And, you know, you almost get sick of people telling you, yeah, yeah, I know. You look, you know it's, and it's, it's overbearing, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I've seen this in humanity. I've seen it over and over and over again in many different ways, shapes, and forms of humans working for free because, one, we are creators. We are born of our creator, and we are creators. We can't help that. Money does not force people to create. People will create regardless of money. So that's the big, okay, so there's two major spells that have been placed upon us, corporations and money, and these are talismans and contracts. They're the same ancient Egyptian magical spells that have been used throughout time. Uh, they have led us astray in that way. So... You have to get to events like this because people don't seem to bust out of their their boundaries unless they go to some sort of altered state. So there are other ways of reaching these altered states using, say, hallucinogenics, but you can also just go to an altered state event. So if you go out, out to Rainbow, you're in the National Forest, but people are building life-size pirate ships out of dead wood to make stages, you know, they're, they're investing all their time and effort into building just because it's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see people actually interact between one another. Or if you go into, uh, say, Kerrville Folk Festival in Austin, Texas, or in Kerrville, Texas, you'll find all people all just making this conference or this uh, festival work, and none of them getting paid. They all just do it because they love to see this event happen. And I can tell you again and again and again how, how people will work and create for free. So first you've got to develop this faith in humanity. You've got to allow everybody to break free. We've got to really promote these alternate technologies. We have now devices that can power entire houses that don't require a grid, that don't require power lines. We have Tesla foundations dying to get their information out, trying to get everybody, look, we never needed power lines. We never needed J.P. Morgan. We could have done this. We could have everything for free. We could have fresh water. We could have housing. We could have uh, electricity for everyone without pollution, you know. All of these technologies are there, but we can't use them because of the powers that be are staying in place. Mm -hmm. And release any of this type of freedom to you. So first we have to take it upon ourselves to remove our free will agreement to their, uh, their plans we have to go with non-compliance, and it's going to take a force of us. And I know the force out there. I've seen 500,000 people gather at the NWO or the ITO, <laughs> IMF, WTO protest. You know, I've seen 500,000 gather for this event and that event. I mean, there are millions of us that are ready to say we quit. Right. If everybody can do it all at once. Uh, the friendship agenda has been our answer, trying to come get people together and then to meet in the real world uh, so that socialization starts to happen. But that's really the critical thing. Start throwing block parties. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know people around you. Realize who all these people are and stop binding yourself from socializing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I, the, I, I think that that's a, it's a huge bridge that uh, needs to be created uh, in our lives. Because the irony is, is that we're more connected than ever before and we're more disconnected than ever before as well. It's a really fascinating sort of um, Zen cone that we're, that we're dealing with. I mean, right, people can listen to you and I right now in um, you know, Belgium or Brazil. And, and at the same time, you know, they may not really care about or know about, you know, who's, living below them or above them, or if they do know about them, they probably don't even want to talk to them. So it's a real interesting dichotomy we're in. I wanted to ask you about Brazil, by the way. I want, I want to know what you know about Brazil, because I think Brazil is very interesting. And obviously on the agenda, getting the Olympics 
and also getting the um, the World Cup. And Can also, we, go ahead. Mind if uh, you just cover the air for uh, for a split second while I run? Yeah, go for it. So what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Freeman about is Brazil, and Brazil is uh, a pretty interesting place in that they're being set up uh, over the course of the next eight years with the uh, the Olympics will return. And when it returns, it'll be in Brazil. You saw the closing ceremony in London. And at the end of every closing ceremony, they bring on the host country and an artist that represents the host country. Uh, in China, the, the artist for the host country, which was England uh, in these past Olympics, was Jimmy Page, the guitarist for Led Zeppelin, and also a, an ardent student and devotee of Aleister Crowley, a very interesting person to have show up at the uh, China Olympics. And in London, um, they put, essentially what they did is they created a, um, a Yoruba ritual, and I believe that they were channeling Yemen Ja for the, uh, for the Brazilian Olympics, the Olympics that will be held in Rio de Janeiro. And also Brazil is going to get the uh, the World Cup, which is huge. So these are all two very uh, permanent, uh, very very prominent events that are going to be shaping Brazil as a as a focus for what's going to be taking place over the next eight years. Also, Brazil is one of the countries that's in the BRIC consortium: Brazil, Russia, India, China. These are all countries that have received massive amounts of money, large infusions of cash. And as a result, what's taking place in Brazil is a, a, a huge amount of commercialization, industrialization, and they're, and they're slaughtering tribes in the rainforest as a result now. They they basically, all the restrictions on anything related to the rainforest are gone. They're decimating the rainforest, and they're going after the, the indigenous tribes in the rainforest. And one of the most, um, and we, maybe we talk about this with Freeman, uh, one of the one of the more prominent figures in Brazilian culture is a woman by the name of Shusha, who was a, uh, for all intents and purposes, a child prostitute. And what she's there to do is to indoctrinate um, Brazilians into the concept that pedophilia is okay. Are you there, Freeman? Yes. Okay. So I just I just gave some backstory on Brazil. And I, right. and I think I think it's a really interesting place. And my and my theory about Brazil is that it's the new Atlantis. That this is this is where they they want to they want you know with Brasilia and everything that's taking place. You also have um, sort of the national model of Brazil, this top runway model. Her name is Lia T, and and Lia T is the former son of a Brazilian footballer, and she's now she's been on Oprah. Um, she's been on fashion magazine. She's she's a transsexual. It's a boy who became a girl. Is now Leah T. And this has become the face of Brazil along with Shusha. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on Brazil. Yeah, that would fit in perfectly as well. And as I was saying in their hermaphroditic programming. Yeah. Uh, well, what I find most intriguing is that uh, we're we're watching as as the global conflict is, is coming to a head, and of course we have to make it happen, you see, that's what all the propaganda is for, so they can't just make something. So what they wanted was America to go into the world court. They, they needed us to be held on high treason and war crimes. And so they manufactured 9-11, and then they manufactured it to make it so easy that a, a, a high schooler could could prove it was an inside job. Uh, you know, and then you believe it whether you know, you know, if you want to believe it. But the proof was all there; it was easily provable. And of course, now everybody is calling for war crimes against Bush and Cheney and all of them, and trying to get this into the world court, which was the plan. For, as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of 9-11 was to cause this, this world court um, putting America as Satan in the, in the world's eyes. But what happened was the Bushes and uh, the Cheneys, uh, they had already prepared for this very scenario, just as the Nazis did before the end of World War II. 
they had already prepared to head over to Chile and to Brazil, and the Nazis all came down. Well, so in the same way, as we started to prepare for this downfall of America and us being brought up for war crimes, thanks to, you know, truthers, really, you know, that was our job, according to the CIA and whoever programs us, the NSA, was to get us to call for these war crimes, because they can't do it, right? We got to do it. And Mm -hmm. so they convinced us to call out for these war crimes. But no one, as the Nazis were not punished, they were sent off to America to start Walt Disney World and uh, NASA. Uh, Same way that this regime, this Nazi regime of America is prepared. And what have they done? They've gone down and bought all these ranches in Paraguay. Yeah. Now, Ranch the Bushes bought in Paraguay was right next door to a town of twins that they believed was crafted by the genetic manipulation of, of uh, um, Mangalay. Mangalay. Uh, so, you know, we got this town of trends from Mangala there in Paraguay. The Bush's ranch is not too far from there. And, yeah, they have all of the best resources as well as far as water. But what you're saying is, yeah, they also destroy the aboriginal tribes. They've got to kill off the earth energies. I really do believe this. I believe that's why they destroyed most of the aboriginal tribes around the world. It's not just to take their lands. It's to kill their energy. And then I found where they were actually placing another seal of Solomon to bind spirits on a Native American burial ground, which is Nashville. And they've uh, set up a, a seal there, which they call the Bicentennial Mall. And that's a seal set on top of these Native American souls to bind their spirits. So I see this type of level as well. But, yeah, absolutely, I'm watching as they are preparing to to flee to to that, that very region, more especially Paraguay around Brazil, and uh, and leave us hanging with, with the bill, as it were, as we go through the, the Nuremberg trials. Now, I had called it that when I was, pre- pre- I was predicting this, right? I said, okay, they're going to call for the American Nuremberg trials. And that was what the news even called it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, yeah, see, I'm saying all this before it happens. Uh, So that's what I really expect is this whole war tribunal to go down and all of them. Yeah, I agree with you. They're all heading down there. Yeah, yeah. Wild stuff. Absolutely wild stuff, wild times. And you probably wouldn't want to be anywhere else right now. I mean, this is what we all signed up for, right? And this is why we're here. We're here to be here right now to witness this, to participate with it, in it, through it, to arrive at some greater understanding and um, there's probably no other place in the universe that offers this kind of opportunity right here and now. Wouldn't you agree, Freeman? Oh, this is some serious soul growth right here. Yeah. You know, every time again, I, I question my soul as to why it chose to come here now. But most of the time, I'm amazed and delighted to be on Earth uh, at this moment because I, I feel I'm eternal and I don't worry so much about this. Uh, I'm just gathering the lessons that I can and doing all the best I can to help others. So, yeah, I find it uh, totally amazing to be alive right now. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And there are – what's really interesting is that in as much as there is all this encroaching darkness, you know, there's you out there. You're, you're, you're tripping. You're having a great time meeting people. You're experiencing grace. And – and I know that there are people in their lives that are having peak experiences that in spite of everything that we're being told and everything that is coming at us, there is the potential, the real potential to break through this at an equal, uh, at an equally accelerated rate as it's coming at us. And I think that that's really the hardest thing to understand and to anchor uh, in our lives. And, and I also feel like it's very important And I think you picked up on this, Freeman, to be able to be with people who also get it, because that will also accelerate your own um, evolution along this path. And then we get into this whole notion and concept of networks and developing networks. And I think that's that's also what you're doing as well. And I really want to thank you for everything uh, that you do with your work and and the risk that you take. Uh, both from a political perspective, but also from a personal perspective as well. Because, you know, I think a lot of times to get out there, people have to appear to be foolish. 
And and I appear to be foolish, I know, um, in the eyes of a lot of folks. And I think, you know, if people were to look at you and see your work, you know, there's a certain amount of that. There's the, the aspect of the divine fool. And so it's a risk to do what, what you do and, and what I do, what a lot of other people are doing right now. I don't want to thank you for taking that risk, Freeman. No, oh, well, thank you, Robert. It, it you know, I, I don't know what else I could do, honestly. I, I had to leap. And it was a moment when I asked myself, do I want to put my face on television behind all of this? And am I, you know, is it time to cower and hide or is it time to stand and shine? And it's time to stand and shine. Let's do it. Let's make it fun. Uh, every protest I've ever been to has been a lot of entertainment. <laughs> I yeah. mostly go to protests just to be around like-minded people because I don't really believe protest changes anything. My whole goal of going is simply to meet the others that are there. Uh, I've never seen a protest change anything, but I've seen gatherings change things. I've seen people gathering change things because they come out with this new knowledge that humans are all right. And yeah. they, they see. Uh, but like I say, it takes an altered state uh, to accomplish this because uh, we're too caught in our cycles. we we got to break out of our cycles, we, we, these circles that we're in. Yeah, I I totally agree. Well, I'm re- I'm getting ready to break out of my my circle. I'm I'm actually going to be moving to Austin, so I'll be occupying your old territory. Nice. Yeah. Say hi to everybody at Epoch for me. Uh, <laughs> my favorite coffee shop. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll do I'll, that. John, you're going to enjoy that. Yeah. We're going to yeah. probably come back to Lawrence, Kansas after this Kickstarter gets done. Get back and- to writing our. And put some roots down in the Midwest. I like that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was I was taken out to meet the Mayans, right, for the, the winter solstice celebration of 2009 at the pyramids there. It was the first time ever they did an all-night ritual. And I got to spend a lot of time with the Mayan shamans, who were also Freemasons, by the way. And, you know, their whole philosophy and, and belief system is based on synchronicity, and they really felt that this would be the – that in their ritual, their whole concept for 2009 was to bring the tribe of nations together. And they didn't prepare it or plan it, but sure enough, members of every nation showed up, I being the representative of America, and a number you know, from every other place. And that's what you'll see on FriendshipAgenda.com is the, the people that all gathered for this, uh, the tribe of nations, as I've, I've called them. And the Mayans showed me some maps on, on – they said they got from the Great White Brotherhood, but they were actually crafted for a book, 55-2000, where the end world was supposed to end back then. I've been through so many end-of-the-world scenarios. But we have these maps now on my website where if you want to see what the world would look like after a crustal shift. And, of course, Lawrence, Kansas is, is surviving in each and every end-of-the-world map I've ever seen. It's also highlighted in J.J. Hartak's um, – Keys of Enoch, because it is the center of the United States. And for some reason, I am just called there spiritually. I love the town. Walt Disney based his whole Main Street theme and Walt Disney World on on this area. Uh, And so I do love Lawrence, Kansas a lot. But on many other levels, it seems like a spiritual site that needs to be held. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. That's over uh, William Burroughs taught Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, he was. I was there when he died. Yeah, interesting. Hey, I have one. I have one question to ask you. Okay, it's a personal question. All right. So, all right. All right so, um, people who follow you know that your father was pretty high up in the Bavarian Illuminati, right? Is that right? No, I think that's been kind of misconstrued. Okay. Can you set the record straight on that then? Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, my dad was a worshipful master of the uh, Scottish Rite and York Rite Freemasonry uh, in Kaiserslautern. Okay. So while he was, I don't know what he was doing in Kaiserslautern, to be honest with you. Uh, but my dad was was on the killer submarine with Jimmy Carter. So the very first killer submarine, he, he became friends with Jimmy Carter, uh, who wrote my dad when he became president. Uh, then he be- went on to Chasing Flying Saucers for Project Blue Book. 
And in that, all he ever told me was, yeah, flying saucers are real. And I got confirmation of what he said about being stationed on a South Sea island with four radar dishes tracking the incoming uh, spacecraft. So I got confirmation that those radar dishes are exactly what they use in, in Project Blue Book and, and in the extraterrestrial chasing. So I've actually confirmed that from my dad. He's dead now. Uh, mm-hmm. He died the day I was supposed to interview him about all of this. So that's kind of another curious conspiracy for me. But then finally he was building nukes for Martin Marietta when I was born. Uh, he built our first computer. He bur- built our first color television and all of that. But so my father was a high-ranking, although Masons hate that term, I say high-ranking because he was worshipful master. So everyone can reach the 32nd degree, but then there's uh, levels inside. Master, like being king of the lodge, and you only get to be that for a certain amount of time, and then they, uh, you know, they vote in a new king or a new worshipful master. So my father was worshipful master of the Kaiser Schlatten Lodge, chasing flying saucers on killer submarines and, and building nukes, um, but it wasn't the Bavarian Illuminati, no. And then my mother was Eastern Star. She was a Nazi youth that was raised and uh, has personally met Walt Disney, and she was raised in the Eastern Star, which is the, the co-masonry, the feminine or female side, but you can have you can, men and women can join Eastern Star. Uh, you, you'll recognize that one. It's the inverted pentagram with the word fatal inside of it. And you'll see a lot of places. So my mom was Eastern Star. She was raised by a witch in France, or what you, they called a, a renowned healer who would go out and cast spells under the full moonlight. And then she was married to you know, what was known as the grand potentate of Freemasonry in, in Kaiser Slotten, who was the man who raised my father to the worshipful master status, and then my dad took my mom from the grand potentate of Freemasonry, and this is actually uh, illegal, I guess, in inside of Freemasonry. You cannot marry another worshipful master's wife, even uh-huh. if they're divorced. And so my father actually had to leave uh, the secret societies to be with my mother. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So here comes part two of this question. Thank you for clearing that up, by the way. So there are some people out there who think that because you have all these connections in your past, that you're that you're like an insider, that you're a gatekeeper. And I don't believe that to be the case, by the way. But there are people that have that perception. Have you ran across that perception, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, I get a lot of that. Uh, I, I usually just unfriend them on my Facebook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true, but I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it, it, it has, and, and because I chose the name Freeman, or the name Freeman chose me, because that's not my name. That's just a, a road name that, that came my way. I was actually working at a restaurant, and I was like, I am not a number, because they were calling me number three. And uh-huh. I, like, I am a fan, and they put that on my name tag. So that's how I got the name Freeman, and I've been Freeman for, you know, 20 years or more. Uh so I, a lot longer than the Freeman on, on the radio and whatnot. But I had no idea about the 13 Illuminati bloodlines. I had yet to read Fritz Springmeier at this point. And I, when I was predicting 9-11 and, and doing all of the early predictions that I did, I had never heard of Alex Jones or uh, you know, William Cooper or any of these other people. All of my research is my own. I just want to make that clear. I, I did not follow anyone. I didn't follow David Icke. I could have written The Biggest Secret. Uh, you know, and by the yeah. time I read that, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm way beyond that already. Uh, so all I'm saying is that this research and all my own work, uh, to say to the dissenters that, oh, Freeman's the Illuminati name, well, it's not my name. It was just a name that I, I picked because I am a free man. And, of course, then the Freeman on the land came out and just destroyed my name, but what am I going to do? They right. destroyed it for me for public, public sakes because now you can Google Freeman and you'll find all these other things. You yeah, Morgan Freeman. You, you Google Freeman, you get ten thousand pictures of Morgan Freeman. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, but I, I do take up about thirty pages of Google search if you type in Freeman or Freeman TV or Freeman Perspective. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot, you know. Yeah, and I keep going. And well, we're right on. For you. Yeah, well, and we're glad you're doing it, and you keep doing it. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, weird stuff. And, and Freeman TV's got all, all the information on that, right? 
You there? Yeah, right now we just have the link to Weird Stuff Magazine. Um, but we'll have the Kickstarter going by Monday, I hope. I was hoping to have it done today, but I couldn't get it ready. Uh, you know, that kind of tripped me out, too, because I'll tell you what, Kickstarter knew where I was born and wh- what I used to drive and everything. Oh, my God. You know, we're in this, uh, this system now. There's no oh, yeah. way out of that. It's the matrix, yeah. my friend. It's the total matrix. All right. Well, have fun at uh, UFOCon this week in Santa Clara. And you're going to be there on Saturday, tomorrow, and uh, bop down there and uh, – Press the Flesh with Freeman and Jordan Maxwell and all these other uh, anti-Illuminati luminaries. So, Freeman, thanks again for coming on, and um, hopefully we'll have you back on again at some time, and maybe you and I will actually meet in uh, this third-dimensional realm here soon, okay? Fantastic, Robert. I look forward to it. All right. Take good care. All right. Good night. Have Bye. a good day. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> All right, that was Freeman. How about that, ladies and gentlemen? Round of applause. That was some awesome, awesome shit. Freeman laid it down. We got into it today, and hopefully we'll get him back again. It felt like we were just scratching the surface. But, um, yeah, it was a great show, and uh, great to finally connect with him. And I want to thank uh, both uh, uh, T. Power and uh, Darren. Uh, Darren Williams for bugging him and telling him that this would be a good venue for him. And I think it was. So catch him this weekend at uh, UFOCon. And by the way, I guess you can see that live on Freeman TV. You can have, you can follow that stream live and catch him there. Even if you can't be in Santa Clara, California. All right. <clears throat> so that's it. Um, that's uh, one hour and 50 minutes of Freeman in the can. And I'll be seeing you again on Monday for the Monday mashup and we'll see where we are in terms of the, uh, the North African, the Middle Eastern theater on fire. I'm working on a new post for the website, which has a lot of this information that, uh, that I kind of got in today. I wish Freeman had a little more background on it, but it's breaking news and uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty scary on some level because it also coincides by the way, with the end of the Illuminati clock, which we didn't get into. And I would have loved to have done that. So, all right, we'll see you on Monday. We'll report back here. We'll compare notes. We'll mash it up. And um, and it's off on to another week. As I approach my solar return, always a fun time for me in my life. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open what's possible. I want to thank Freeman for coming on the show today. And uh, we'll uh, bring him back on another time. All right. Adios. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.